John Jolliff, thank you for joining me again. It's great to see you and it's great to uh, have you back on the Spirit Farm podcast via Zoom. Yeah. The world has changed since the last time we spoke. The world has changed. And yeah. uh, I, I like what you are, are doing. You are, you've kind of cut off a lot of your uh, inputs from the outside. Uh, say more about that. Well, you know, I once thought, I mean, I've, I've done a whole rethink, reboot on what I think are assets. Hmm. I used to think, you know, your 401k, I was an asset. I used to think that being on, in touch and being up to date uh, on everything that was in the news was an asset. You know, you want to be well informed. But I've come to realize that the real assets is your immunity system. Mm. And that we should invest more in our immunity system and enrich that than our 401k. Wow. As part of that immunity system, I had to eliminate all the extraneous stress that was going on in my life, starting with the news. Yeah. I think it's I think it's uh I think it's the wrong word. It's no longer news, it's more commentary. Yeah. And it's a one pony parade. They news whatever channel you pick, pick any channel, they're one pony parades. You know, yeah. it's all about this. And then then, then for twenty four and then about forty uh, 30 days, then it's all about that for 30 yeah. days. Yeah. So I just stopped uh, all newspapers. I stopped listening to the news altogether. I absolutely have no idea what's going on in the world. And I'm happier, I'm lighter on my feet, and uh, less informed. Who would have thought that being less informed would be an actual asset? Yeah. Yeah, but I agree with you. I love you framing it as uh, the, your, one of your greatest assets being your immunity system and the oh. over stimuli, the over the introduction of too much input is yeah. kind of, uh, it's negatively affecting that immunity system and your mental health. And so well, we used I, to think that we are living in a technology revolution. We're not living in a technology revolution, in my opinion. We're living in an access revolution. Yeah. Information has too much access to me. Instagram, yeah. Facebook, all the other you know ways of getting in touch with me. It's an access revolution that I think has to be better managed. Yeah. So I chose to to do a reset, and I just cut it all off. I mean, as much as I can, of course. Yeah. Well, Hillary and I are doing a uh, a physical reset right now. We're we're doing a, a cleanse and. Uh, okay. doing, just doing shakes and then this particular drink that's supposed to just cleanse you out. So for, for nine days, we're doing that and it's having, I'm, we're, we're on day four and it's having great, it's having a great effect. You don't even realize that you don't need the extra crap. We, our bodies are yeah. just trained, we're trained to want it, but we, we certainly don't need it. And And I have more energy now than I did when I was eating whatever I wanted. And I'm sure it's, the same sugar, with you know the sugar, inputs on your mind. Sugar makes you more susceptible to COVID and to viruses and all kinds of other complications. So yeah, if we can cut out sugar, uh, we're going to be in good shape. Yeah. Well, among other, I, that's I love the insight and the the conviction around doing maybe kind of a, an input detox. But that's not even yeah. what we were going to talk about today. Uh, <laughs> We, we, I want to cover another topic, and maybe we'll come back and, and check in with you in the future well, about how your detox is going. You know, it's a good transition because what we're going to talk about is the narrative going on between our ears, the conversation that goes on when our lips don't move. And that's, that's a detox. could be. Yep. It certainly could be. So I, I want to set it up. Uh, with your own words, this this is a write up that that you gave to me, and I want to read that to get us going, and then throw it over to you to elaborate. So we're calling this emotional reeducation, and uh, you say this: God provided each of us with the ability to create satisfying lives. We will succeed in doing so if we carefully follow God's blueprint for our emotional reeducation. We do not have to struggle or be unhappy. Unhappiness is a choice, but like all choices, it's not enough to just have the freedom of choice. 
we must know how to implement the choices we choose. Our discussion about emotional re-education is not about planning what you want. Our discussions are about making what you want happen. Our discussion will provide uh, the necessary advice any of us will need for pursuing goals, taking risks, conducting more satisfying relationships, and better managing unpleasant life issues. Very articulate. <laughs> so, someone's really sharp who wrote that, yeah. <laughs> Very good. And I know that you have walked through some of this with me and with Hillary uh, because we have right. sat across uh, the opposite chair from you in some counseling sessions. And, uh, and this, is, this is great stuff. Uh, in terms of rewiring, re-educating our, ourselves emotionally, uh, we're going to talk about what you call the ABCs. And Hill, Hillary and I still refer to the ABCs uh, from times that we've sat with you. Very helpful. So you take us from there. That's, that's the backdrop. Where should we go? Well, remember, in one of our interviews, one of the podcasts we did, you asked mm -hmm. me at the tail end of the interview, can you talk a little bit about the ABCs? I did. And I said, why don't we hold that for a complete uh, session? Yeah. And I'm not even going to have time in this session to really give you the, the, full, uh, the full monte, shall we say. Yeah. But uh, there are three aspects to it. And I'm going to give you the first two, and I'm going to tell you about the third. And so whether we do another one and take the third or maybe – we come to your workshop that you're going to have maybe in the fall of 2021. Uh, we'll take the whole and do the whole, the whole workshop. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's, let's at least do this and then we'll have you back. We can take, we can take the C yeah. number three uh, on, an, on another episode and we can still do it live in the future. Okay. Well, you know, this, what we're going to talk about today is not new. This is something that everybody's going to identify with and understand once they hear it. But I've tried to simplify things that are very complex. And I'm going to show you a diagram in just a moment that is going to, it can truly transform uh, the way you operate in the world today. It'll improve self-esteem. It'll help you with fears, whether it's COVID or anything else. It's going to help you uh, in your relationship with other people. Uh, there's so many powerful opportunities here with the material I'm going to share with you. But I, I want to tell you, first of all, it's not new. There was a Greek Stoic philosopher back in the first AD that was saying, men and women are not disturbed by the things, but by their view of them. And then, of course, Shakespeare expressed a similar view in Hamlet when he said, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Mm. There was a French philosopher, Montanet, who said, a man is not hurt so much by what happens as by what his opinion is about what happens. Mm. The late Wayne Dyer used to say, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And lastly, there's a literature that predates them all with King Solomon. And he wrote in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinketh in himself, so is he. Now, so we need to start with a very basic understanding of how our emotional system works. When people come to see me, they never come to see me and say, John, I don't like the way I think. They come in and they tell me they don't like the way they feel. Yeah. I'm here to tell you that every feeling that we have, I'm talking about emotional feelings now, not physical ones, but every feeling we have, even our extreme negative feelings and emotions, are created by the things we think, the way we perceive, and the beliefs we hold. And therefore, there's many, many, many of us, Christian or otherwise, that are entertaining unverifiable thoughts. All right, so you're gonna see the ABCs, and the ABCs are A, a fact, event, and a situation takes place. We have a thousand of these every day. Then followed by B, self-talk, 
inner dialogue. It's the narration. It's the way you evaluate the facts, events, and situations that take place every day. And depending on how uh, verifiable, how uh, true your self-talk is, you're going to have a feeling and emotion. Those who think unverifiable thoughts, they can't be verified. There's no basis to truth in them. Those who feel think unverifiably are going to have more trouble with their feelings and emotions. But we all live in an ABC world where things happen. We then think to ourselves, we counsel ourselves. Self-counseling is the most effective kind of counseling there is because we take our own advice. Unfortunately, effective is not necessarily beneficial. So although we're very effective, we may not be very beneficial. So as something happens in A, we then think about it in B. We may have one thought. We may have four thoughts. We may have a 100 thoughts. And then C, we have a feeling and emotion. All feelings and emotions come from B. They do not come from A. So that's not how we were raised. We were all raised to believe we lived in an AC world. So what is that? An AC world means that the things that go on in our lives, people showing up late, people not inviting us to the event, all the things that go on in A cause us to feel C. They cause us to feel our feelings and emotions. And therefore, we, if we're ever going to feel differently, if you live in an AC world, if you're ever going to feel differently, you have to change A. Yeah. You have to change other people. You have to change the world in order to feel better. That's what someone would think, right? So what, what you're saying is if A is the event, this is the thing that happened. B is how I think about it. C is how I feel or you know, how I'm processing it or yeah, what I'm feeling. And so we go, I feel badly. A needs to change. That's, that's the natural instinct for most humans. If somebody did something wrong. Somebody didn't show up. There's always some reason to why if you live in an AC world. Unfortunately, we never did. I mean, fortunately, we never did. But we didn't know that. What I'm teaching you now and what we're reviewing here is something that 7 billion people or 7.7 billion people don't know. They don't know this. So let me ask two questions. One is, can anybody do your bees for you? Can anybody do your self-talk for you? No, that's just me. No, that's right. Nobody can digest your food but you. Nobody can do your thinking but you. Therefore, from this day forward, you can never blame somebody else for making you feel. Mm. You make me feel upset. You make me feel angry. You make me feel unloved. You make me feel frustrated. Because what frustrates you? What makes you angry? What makes you feel unloved and unappreciated? The way that you're interpreting it, the way you're thinking about the thing. That's exactly right. Your self-talk, your inner dialogue. So you can't blame anybody else anymore if you're going to pay attention to what we're talking about here. Second question. Can you think anybody's bees for them? No, it's on them. No, same thing. You can't digest their food and you can't think for them. Therefore, from this day forward, you can never take responsibility for how people feel. You cannot say, I'm sorry I made you upset. I'm sorry I, I made you angry. I'm sorry I make you feel unloved. Because what makes them feel angry? What makes them feel unloved, uncared for? Their self-talk. Yeah, their interpretation, the way they're thinking about the event. That's exactly right. So we can have compassion. We can say, I'm sorry you're upset. I'm sorry you're angry with me. I'm sorry you feel unloved by me. We can be compassionate, but we can't sign up and say, I'm sorry I made you feel that way. Yeah. Would, so would, would that be would that be like a, a, a derivative or a cousin of codependency, kind of thinking that 
I am responsible for how this person feels or they are responsible for how I feel instead of taking the responsibility for what's going on in my in my mind. Well, I think I think codependency has a lot of error. You see, has a lot of error. But until you understand the ABCs, you wouldn't know where the error is. Mm. We would probably say the error is the way you feel. When you really mean it's the way you think. Mm. Without this ABC diagram, you don't have a way of talking about what's really going on dynamically. Yeah. People are constantly confusing their thoughts and their feelings. I might say to you, so how do you feel about the ABCs? And you might say, I feel this could be very helpful. And I would say that's not a feeling. Right. You're thinking it could be very helpful. I think it would be very helpful. Well, if you thought it would be very helpful, then how would you feel? Optimistic. Hopeful. Optimistic. Yeah. Happy. Well, there's so we much freedom. There's so much freedom in this because right now, uh, so many of us are, they, we don't like how we're feeling. We associate it, which we're calling C. We associate it with a, so we think we need to change the A, and so we avoid all these kinds of people, uh, and we cut this person out of our life, and we don't go to these kinds of places, and we limit ourselves in so many different ways. Now, sometimes boundaries are, are important. Car. We need to live in a different place. We need a different right. car. But you know what happens when you get the different car in the different house in a different community? You walk in there with your same old B. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Same, same thinking, same processing, same way I'm interpreting events. Yeah. Yeah. So there's three parts to this. The first part we're introducing now, that the ABCs actually exist. More particularly, that B exists. So yeah. we have to, first of all, present the argument that there's a B that exists. Yeah. The second part of this is start capturing your bee. Yeah. Because if you're not awake and aware of your bee, this is not going to help you. Right. Right. So I then give you an exercise like the ABCs that you can see on the screen. I give you an exercise. Do three ABCs this week. When you're in a situation, maybe the first thing you think about is the way you're feeling. OK, then go backwards. What might you have been thinking that created this feeling? What was happening that you interpreted the way you did that led to the feelings you have? Yeah. Do three ABCs. Start capturing your beast. Don't let any B exist without you being aware of it. Yeah. And what you're going to find is there's a lot of unverifiable thoughts. Let's okay. Let's let's extrapolate that a little bit. So. When you when you've told me before about unverifiable thoughts, you've said that an unverifiable thought is something that you can't take a picture of, you can't take a recording of, or, or, or those are the two things. If you can't if you can't record it, if you can't take a photo of it, then it's in your own head. Or as we often uh, are are guilty of. We're living in someone else's head, <laughs> assuming what that meant, assuming what they're thinking, assuming, right? It's unverifiable. I know, I, know I know what you're thinking. No, I don't. <laughs> I'm only projecting what I'm thinking you might be thinking. Right. Yeah, I, I'm not all that concerned about right or wrong, good or bad, positive or negative. My, my ministry, my work is to try to determine what is true from what is false. Today, that's hard enough. Mm. If I can find out what's true, I'll let other people judge the truth. Is the truth positive or negative, right or wrong, good or bad? I'll leave that up to somebody else. I'm just trying to find out what the truth is. Mm. The Bible says very clearly, think on what is true and lovely. Anything worthy of praise, worthy of repute, think on and dwell on that. Yeah. And the next verse, and the God of peace shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah. It doesn't think, think on what's positive or negative. In my opinion, positive thinking is no better than negative thinking. Hmm. People talk about uh, negative thinking as being uh, sad or bad or makes you unhappy or, you know, 
But there's more. There's a more important insight. Negative thinking is untrue. Are there you're not, exceptions? You're not, you're not touching anybody with this spirit farm broadcast. This is a waste of time. This is a this is a kind of a, a celebrity project of yours. Mm. Now, somebody would say that's negative thinking. I think more importantly, it's not even true. Yeah. And positive thinking is, no, is the same way. Your spirit farm broadcast is going to be bigger than Google. It's just going to be, it's going to be bigger than Google. Okay, make, puffs you up, makes you feel great for a moment. But the, the bigger point is, it's not true. Probably. I don't take anything away. I don't jinx you at all. But it's probably not true. But right. positive or negative are just not true. I'm thinking, and the Bible's teaching, think only on what's true. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And now you see five rules of optimum mental and emotional health. The first rule of optimum mental and emotional health is when your thinking is based on objective reality, you're going to have more optimum mental and emotional health. But how do you know what's the difference between objective reality and subjective reality? Subjective reality is imagination. It doesn't have to be verifiable. People are going to realize they start their be as unverifiable, and it's so subjective. So how do you know the difference? It's what you were just saying. If you can take a picture of it with a camera, you know it's true. If you can tape record that somebody else is saying these things, then you know it's true. But, of course, if you can't, it's subjective reality. Yeah. And you're only going to have optimum mental and emotional health if you're thinking about what's true, objective, verifiable. Now, have you been sitting with someone or coaching someone in this and it's like this is a big challenge for them? They're, they're so, they feel like they're so intuitive and maybe that is a strength uh, and, or they have this past experience or they think that they know people really well and they push back at you and they're like, well, no, I. I, I really do kind of know what they're thinking because this happened before or whatever. How, how would you coach someone who really wrestles with this, take a picture, record it, or it's non-verifiable and it's not helping you? Well, the first thing is I want them to bring in their APCs. I think it's very important that you have homework for people. Yeah. And once they see the ABCs, and then we take it through the five rules. Now, the five rules, as you can see on the screen, when your thinking violates three of the five rules, then it has to be changed. It has to be debated. You can't allow something to go on uh, if it's unverified. So uh, rule number one, when your thinking uh, uh, is not verifiable. Okay. Uh, the second rule is when your thinking helps you preserve your life, you're going to have more optimum mental and emotional health. Now, that rule rarely comes into play, unless you're thinking I'd be better off dead than alive. But that rule really has to play. Okay. So rule number one, when your thinking is based on objective reality. Rule number three, when your thinking helps you accomplish your goals most quickly. And when people start doing their ABCs, they're going to see that their thinking is not going to help them accomplish their goals most quickly. It derails them. It inhibits them. It creates all kinds of challenges, you know. The fourth one is when your thinking helps you avoid significant trouble with other people. You're going to have optimum mental and emotional health. The fifth one is when your thinking helps you prevent or quickly eliminate significant emotional conflict you're going to have optimum mental and emotional health. Prevent or quickly eliminate significant emotional conflict. So the five rules quickly, any thought that violates three of the five rules, again, it doesn't have to be perfect. If it violates three of the five rules, it needs to be changed, challenged, and debated. It's not based on objective reality. Cam rule of thumb. It doesn't help you preserve your life. It doesn't help you accomplish your goals most quickly. 
it doesn't help you uh, avoid significant trouble with other people. And it doesn't help you prevent or quickly eliminate significant emotional conflict. You see, if you violate three of those five rules, that thought has to be debated. So the first part was, let's teach you that B exists. There is such a thing as ABCs. Second part is you need to start capturing your Bs and by doing ABCs. The third part, which we're not going to have time today, is what do you do about challenging and changing and debating the thoughts that you've captured in B, have violated three of the five rules, and you know it has to be changed or debated. So there's a form that I'm going to show you at some point where we actually go about debating. But before we get there, I think people can, on their own, once they understand it's unverifiable, what would be a replacement that is verifiable? Yeah. And that would do a great deal to help with self-esteem, get over fears, all those things. Yeah. Yeah. Asking myself, what's a, a more helpful thought? <laughs> yeah. Because I'm, I'm allowing these thoughts that are unverifiable or they're not meeting the criteria that you just laid out. So they're not helping yeah. me. They're, they're not helping me be who I want to be. They're not helping me move in the direction that I want to move. So I'm, I, I don't want this thought anymore. I'm going to replace it. And, and even if I'm, I'm thinking like, even if I still think that I'm right, like if my brain is still trying to convince me that, yeah, maybe I can't cro- you know, check all the five boxes, but I'm still probably right. Why do I want to be right and miserable? <laughs> yeah, at the expense of having better management over your feelings and emotions. Right. Two thoughts. One is there's a difference. We use the words interchangeably, feelings and emotions. I think I've talked to you about this before on one of the programs. Feelings are things like happiness, sadness, frustration, anger. Okay, that those are feelings. Even depression. Those are feelings. An emotion is a damaged feeling. And so how do we damage feelings? By suppressing them, Mm. by saying people won't like you if they know you feel this way, Mm. by calling certain feelings sinful. When you repress, suppress, and damage the feeling, it becomes an emotion. We are emotionally disturbed. We're not feeling disturbed. And it's all done in our self-talk. Or the self-talk of other people, they tell us, they share it with us, and we take it on as our own without going through the debates. Is this true? Can I verify this to be true? Yeah. So what, what, it's, what you're saying, it sounds like, uh, I'll just reflect this back to you and you can, you can correct me, is that we're all going to have feelings. It's part of being human. And to not judge the feelings, but to allow ourselves to feel the feelings and that that emotion is what becomes like a consistent experience of that feeling that has gotten damaged, that hasn't been processed correctly, that has been uh, suppressed or has been pressed down. And so now I have kind of like an underlying frustration that I'm experiencing all the time. I have an underlying insecurity that I'm experiencing all, or anxiety that I'm experiencing all the time. And, and, and that's a result of not dealing with normal feelings in a healthy way. That's exactly right. When we say, I can't get over my feelings, we're probably talking about emotions. You know, I'm disturbed by something. And it's probably my husband, or it's my wife, or it's my kids, or it's COVID, or it's my job, or, you know, I'm really stuck on something. I've really got some, you know, real frustration I can't get over. A, it's probably an emotion. And B, if you go back and look at your self-talk, it's probably all unver- it's probably all unverifiable. Mm. Yeah. Let me give you let me read you an example. Okay. This is a, a a typical ABC that this woman did. And then I'm gonna ask everybody a question. So her A was after 51 years of life and 15 years of teaching at a Christian elementary school, I have stroke. Now, let's go down to C. Let's jump over B. She feels crying, hopeless, lost, not wanting to live. Mm. 
Now, she's a Christian. Question. Should she be feeling this way as a Christian? Crying, hopeless, lost, not wanting to live. Well, that feels like a trap because I you've told me not to should. <laughs> oh, should I? Oh, buddy. <laughs> Um, but no, right. I mean, we, we certainly wouldn't want her feeling that way. That, that That's not how we would want her feeling. Yeah, but the question is, should she feel that way? Mm. All right. So it is a trick question to expose something that we believe that's not worth believing. Gotcha. Okay. Now, there are two kinds of shoulds. Okay. So when my kids were learning to read, I wrote down all the words that sound the same, spelled the same, but mean different things. Like saw, S-A-W. Right. Is that the past tense of see, or is that to cut wood? You see? And I came across the word should, S-H-O-U-L-D. But did you know there's two shoulds? One is the scientific should. Everything is a natural and logical consequence of everything else. It's a cause and effect. You jump off the roof, you should break your leg mm. or hurt yourself. It's a scientific should. Then for all the magic thinkers, okay, and I would ask your audience if I were there with them, I would say, how many of you believe in magic? Rabbits out of hats. Not sleight of hand, rabbits out of hats. How many of you think your relationship with your spouse is the way it should be right now. How many of you think your relationship with God is the way it should be? How many of you think the world is treating each other the way they should right now? And now we go back to the two shoulds. One is the scientific should, natural and logical consequence should. And the other one for all the magic thinkers is the have to be got to be well it's it's the it's the magic should yeah it's the you should you, must, you have to you're supposed to and all of that you see you impose your wish in, on the world and everybody in it yeah see the word should is really the past tense of shall and the archaic meaning of shall is have to got to it is inevitable yeah. thy will shall be done yeah but we have these two shoulds, scientific and magic. So now we go back to this lady. After 51 years of life, 15 years of teaching at a Christian elementary school, I have a stroke. And her C is crying, hopeless, lost, and not wanting to live. And so I ask you the trick question, should she be feeling this way? The correct answer is, I don't know yet. Let's look at her B. So now let me read you her B, and then I'll ask you again if she should feel this way, thinking the way she is. Gotcha. Number one, the stroke has left me completely dependent upon other people. And so I say to her, oh, so who drove you here today for therapy? How do, how do you, who cooks for you? Who cleans for you? She says, well, not, she got irritated. She says, I drove. I cook. I don't have anybody taking care of me. I said, oh, I was just going off of what you said. The stroke has left you completely dependent upon others. You see the exaggeration, the unverifiable? Secondly, I'm not a commend of things. Third, I fear of what will become of me. Fourth, my life has ended. Five, I wish that my life would really end. Six, I can do more for God dead than alive. And seven, I, can, I can't do anything worthwhile. And even though she's in the stroke ward, of a hospital helping those, you know, worse off than she, she believes she can't do anything worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Now, when you take the culmination of all these seven thoughts that she has, should she be crying, hopeless, lost, and not wanting to live if that's what she's thinking and dwelling in her mind? Yes. Scientifically, that is what should should result. And what should are you using? The scientific. Exactly. It's a natural, logical consequence of the way you think. Now, there are some people who say, no, she shouldn't be that way if she's a Christian. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or what you are. If you you put this kind of stuff, unverifiable stuff in your head, 
it's going to come out in ways you can't even recognize. Yeah. Yeah. That's why that we sense. have to understand the ABCs and you buy into the idea that there really is B that creates C. Then you start you have to start capturing your own Bs. You've got low self-esteem, you've got anxiety, you're afraid of this, you think people don't like you, you're not good enough, whatever the issue is. You start doing ABCs and you're going to see how unverifiable it is. Take the five rules. Which one of your thoughts doesn't fulfill three of the five? This is, uh, this is a game changer, and I think this will be so helpful to anyone who sits down, reflects, applies. And so uh, I'm just encouraging uh, everybody to practice this, to pay attention to their thoughts, to take the thought captive, to write down, okay, this is the A, this is the event, this is the thing that happened, this is the thing that she said, this is the whatever. And then think about our thinking to get to the, to get to the B, and then C, this is how I'm feeling. And then would you come back in another week and kind of and give us the C's? Sure, of course. Now, I'm going to read what you read at the beginning. Okay. Now that we've had exposure to the ABCs, let's go back and read emotional re-education. It says, okay. God provides each of us with the ability to create satisfying lives. What's that ability? The mind, hmm. the thoughts. We will succeed in doing so if we carefully follow God's blueprint for our emotional re-education. God designed us A, B, C. Things are going to happen to you. You're going to think about these. Think on and dwell on and meditate on what is true. Mm. And you're going to see you're going to have feelings. And Try not to have emotions. Don't damage yourself. Mm. We go on to say, we do not have to struggle or be unhappy. Unhappiness is a choice. And where is the choice made? B. But like all choices, it's not enough to just have the freedom of choice. We must know how to implement the choices we choose. Our discussion about emotional re-education is not about planning what we want. Our discussion is about making what you want happen. Our discussion will provide the necessary advice for any of us who will need to pursue goals, take risks, conduct more satisfying relationships, and better manage unpleasant issues of your life. You get your bees flying in formation, and you can go anywhere and do anything. I love it. I love it. It's encouraging, and it's giving me that, that feeling we talked about at the beginning of optimism and hopefulness. And uh, I appreciate Not you taking the time. Not positive thinking. Not positive right. thinking. Verified. Right. Verifiable. John, it's always a pleasure. Thanks for sharing this great insight with us. Uh, we're going to apply it. I'm going to apply it. And then we will re-engage with you and dig into the seas, how, how, those, emotions, how those emotions and feelings can change and, and, and go in a better direction based on our thinking. So uh, I appreciate it. Great to, great to be with you as always. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right. All right.